which raised the question of what is the value of all this altered consciousness and higher consciousness and spiritual liberation and what does it get man? Where does it get us? Well, if you ask the question from the point of view of, from the world point of view, it's a tough one. Because does it bring heaven on earth? Not necessarily. What it may bring is the compassion that has w within it the wisdom of why earth is earth and not heaven, and thus not the longing that it should be other than it is. That is, working with what is rather than trying to, uh, than the discomfort that comes from always living in what could be. At the same moment, there's a paradox here. This is a very profound paradox. The paradox is that the more planes of consciousness you enter into, and the less you are attached to any particular plane, including the physical plane on which the, in which the world exists, the more you become awed by the, you could say, the perfection of the mind of God, or you could say the divine plan, or the exquisiteness of the articulation of the universe, or the things like synchronicity of events, or uh, total interrelatedness of every atom within the universe, lawfully, not rationally lawfully, not, not um, logically lawfully, but naturally lawfully, in the same way that the Tao is a naturally lawful instrument. Um, and at the same moment, seeing the perfection of this, at, that's at the same moment, you still retain your involvement in your incarnation on this earth and you are you become much more aware of the incredible amount of suffering that exists in beings that are lost in the illusion of time and space now i use that word lost in the illusion of time and space because as you alter your consciousness you enter into a state of a, a a space within yourself, a frame of reference within yourself, a point of awareness within yourself, which has nothing to do with time and space. Now that immediately smacks of eternality, but even the concept of eternal is time. And this is even beyond that. So what I am really saying is just what every Eastern philosophy except well, has said in, in, on the on part way home, which is saying that God is within each individual, that that which is beyond time and beyond space exists within you. And when you go in deep enough, you become identified. It's as if, it's as if you have, the image I always like is the one of the television channels. That's such a powerful image, you know. Um, you look at another human being with one channel, say you're on channel seven, you look at another human being and you see their body and you see their sexual identity and you see man and woman and you see strong or weak or fat or thin or old or young. You flip the dial once and you look at another person and you see their psychological makeup. Happy, sad, depressed, manic depressive, uh, courageous, somebody looking into the future, idealist, etc. That would be a reality, a plane of reality. You flip the dial one more channel and you see everybody as Leo or Aries or Sagittarius or Libra. You see everybody in terms of their astral identity. You flip the television channel once more and when you look into somebody's eyes, you see another being just like you, still separate, but just like you, looking back at you. Like, are you in there? I'm in here. Far out. Here we are. And at that point, all of the body, personality, astral identity is all packaging. And there's this being just like you inside a different package than you're in. Okay? That's the soul. That's what we call soul in Western Christianity, for example. Okay? Now, if you go one more flick of the dial, you come to the point where when you look in the eyes of another person, it's like a, it's 
two set two mirrors facing each other with nothing in between. It's it's itself looking at itself, looking at itself, looking at itself. Because within the separate souls is that which is common to all. That is the mystic experience. That's the experience where you've come into the one, where you say the universe is one. We are one consciousness. You have now entered into the oneness. You've gone beyond the multiplicity and into the one. As long as I must add the final flip of the dial just to make the whole picture complete. If you flip the dial once more, then you disappear and the dial disappears and it all disappears because you have gone beyond form. You've gone into the formless. That is, you've gone beyond seeing the one. You've gone into the one and in the one is the zero. There is nothing within the one. In other words, the whole universe of form rests on formlessness. It is as if out of nothing comes everything. But everything is merely an illusion based on nothingness. I mean, there's a, this, is the, this is the most profound kind of wisdom, the paradox that form and formless are the same thing. They're just looked at from different angles or they are experienced in different ways. So that um, as you change your level of consciousness and come into higher planes, you come into, like when you go into the soul, you are no longer, the essence of the soul is not in time. It goes through, it passes through time, but it itself is timeless. Because it is part of that which has no time, which has no beginning and no end. And in that sense, in each individual is something which is not born and which does not die. Now the minute you have touched that in yourself, the fear of death, the meaning of a life experience is immediately changed very profoundly. At first, you don't know how to deal with this new thing that's happened to you because all your habits of seeing the universe are based on how you used to think it was. But it's as if the rug has been pulled out from under your whole conceptual universe, the whole way you think about everything. Now you're left with this new experience that you aren't who you thought you were, and thus the universe isn't what you thought it was because you built the whole universe around who you thought you were. And then very slowly you start to put the pieces back together again in a, an intuitive harmony with what you now sense the universe to be. Right? And um, at first you attempt to find new conceptual models, new thinking models to explain it away. Later you give that up a little bit and you just become very simple. And you just are sitting in, you're sitting in time and space, but you are not of time and space. Like you are in the world, but not of the world. It's that same Im image. And then whatever is called upon for you to do, be it on the physical plane, astral plane, whatever plane, you are there. And since you're not in time and space, you can be in lots of places simultaneously. I mean, it gets very far out when you start to play in these realms of consciousness. So now, I come back to the question of what is the relevance for mankind? Well, for you to be free of fear of death and for to you to be free of the anxiety about life, because uh, uh, that changes the way in which you are attached or lost in your melodrama. Because from my point of view, my entire life must be lived beautifully, exquisitely, consciously, and with great awareness of the implications of every act in every level of reality, including in God, as well as with man. An act has to be true across all planes of existence for it to be totally true. It can be, as we've learned, a, an act can be true on one level and a lie at another. But for an act to be true at every level and in harmony with all the forces in the level, you can't think your way into that situation because it's too complex a factor analytic problem. Your mind couldn't handle it. You can only become like a tree bends with the wind. It does, it flows in the harmony of the universe. You become simple in that sense. It is a whole higher level of uh, knowing, sensing, than the five senses in the thinking mind. It's what uh, Gurdjieff called the higher faculty. It's what, uh, it's the, uh, the mystic realm of thought. It's, um, uh, now, what this realm does is give an individual the opportunity to see the implications of his or her acts 
free of the distortions that are the result of attachments which come out of fear. Once the fear is gone, then there is no clinging. And Buddha said the secret of the game is the end of clinging. His Four Noble Truths, when he came out from under the Bodhi tree, he said, he looks around, he says, any attachment to form to is, is suffering, the suffering, because it's going to change or end. Same thing Christ said when he said, lay not up your treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt. And then Buddha said, the cause of suffering is clinging, clinging to this or that. And then he said, the way you end suffering is to give up attachment or clinging. Now that doesn't mean you give up involvement. If you're married, you don't walk away from your family. You become a perfect wife or a perfect husband. But you're not lost in it. You are just like whatever clothing you're wearing at the moment. You keep it clean and neat but you don't identify yourself with it. You aren't your red sweater. You're just using the red sweater. Well, in the same way you use all your social roles. And you use your car, and you use your personality. It's all there, but who are you? You aren't any of those things. You sit behind, within it. Not superior, not, because that's another, uh, that's another psychological game. This isn't uh, dissociation. This isn't, uh, look how good I am. You're right in the middle of the stew. You're in every moment totally, but there's nothing that catches you. It's like there's nothing that can hook on to you inside. It's like if you have a model of who you think you are and somebody comes up and tells you something which disconfirms it, like you think you're handsome and somebody comes up and says, God, you're ugly. Your first reaction is to that statement in view of what you thought. If you don't have a model of who you are, and they say that, you just see that as an interesting statement that was made because you don't have to hang it on anything since you don't have to have a model of who you are. See, the one thing that's, uh, in the West, we always think we have to have opinions and attitudes about everything. But it turns out you don't have to. You can have them if you need to have them. I mean, I can have opinions about lots of things. But I can sit with a very empty mind all the time. And that... Uh, You can have opinions without being attached to the opinions, and that's uh, kind of a distinction. Now, in terms of social action and social change, social responsibility, like when you become more conscious, do you become less of a social activist? No, not necessarily at all. You become a more conscious social activist. That is, you don't get lost in your own emotions. You become more effective because you're more capable of being conscious of what the, the person on the other side, quote, is experiencing. Because you are living in the realm that exists behind us and them. And so you are able to experience usness and themness, which gives you a distinct advantage in any game you decide to play. Because you are aware of the entire situation rather than merely being locked in your own emotions, in your own anger, or your own frustration, or your own desires. So, what are the implications for the world? Well, the world has great need and use for wise men in the culture. Kings always surround themselves with wise men. And then that concept was lost, and we surrendered to knowledgeable people, people with very powerful, rational minds. Henry Kissinger, Herman Kahn, people like this. But these people are not wise men. They almost are. I mean, a situation almost demands that a Henry Kissinger become a statesman instead of a politician, instead of a, you know, a, just an intellectual. But it doesn't quite, his ego doesn't quite, the situation didn't force the transcendence of his ego sufficiently so that he became a perfect instrument of the divine will at that moment. Right? And that's what a wise man is. A wise man is somebody that is merely a mirror and an articulator of the flow, which is the way of saying of the will of God. Right? And such a being is at peace because such a being is in the flow of the universe in the same way that a tree is at peace or a river is at peace. And such a being, when he or she is available to somebody who is in the stream of, 
of action. A statesman or a or anybody, any active person, uh, feeds into that active person a resonance with the place in them which is quiet. And a, the highest politician is someone who is quiet inside. It's like my guru used to say about Abe Lincoln, that he knew that, he was, that Christ was the real president, that he was only acting president. And that's the key of the whole game that he's a perfect president because he's not lost in being president. It was, uh, it was almost done by Jack Kennedy because he had Hyannis Port and his father and his family. Because he had a frame of reference that made the presidency a game. Not in the pejorative sense of game, not in a put down, but in the sense of not getting lost in it like Lyndon Johnson got lost in it. He got lost in his ego sense in the game. And that's a key issue, you know. And very few polit political activists, whether they are establishment or revolutionaries, are free of their ego involvement and getting caught in the game. So the games are less well played. Um, what in addition though, in a more profound sense, what all of this stuff is about, is that it closes the ring that starts out literally, well, yes, literally, one way of looking at it literally, with the Garden of Eden. It starts out, if you uh, visualize a clock at 12 o'clock, with man in perfect harmony with God, with the universe. That is the will of God. It's like a perfect clock. And in that perfection, is included the choice that man can make to go against the will of God. That's the one thing that's built in. The, the freedom to go against the harmony is part of the perfection of the game. Right? And that's what man opted to do. The apple represents that choice to know God rather than to be God. To have the individual power of knowing it's like dualism. It's the entrance into dualism. It's the entrance into form, if you will, because you can imagine the Garden of Eden as almost being formless. Although it's characterized as forms, it is really, uh, there's no reproduction at that point, and there's just, it's like, it's like an angelic realm, if you will. Then man comes into a denser realm because he comes into his own mind, which is a much denser space. And he knows, and he's, he's got separate power. From 1201, in which that's happened, up to 6 o'clock, he's spending lifetime after lifetime after lifetime trying to capitalize on what he knows in order to recreate that perfection of heaven and still keep his own power as a separate being. He's trying to become God of the universe as a separate entity. At 6 o'clock comes the despair that he's not going to make it. He's tried everything, and in our culture, the things that you try are trying to get more and more and more of everything. That's one thing you try. Or trying to bring the, each thing you get closer together, the rushes closer together. So that you're eating and in the middle of the main course you're thinking about dessert and in the dessert you're thinking about the coffee and the coffee you're thinking about the cigarette and the cigarette you're thinking about the bowling and the bowling you're thinking about the ice cream soda and then you're thinking about the sex and then you're thinking about what's in the refrigerator. And you're always jamming them in together for fear of having a moment when you're not working to get another rush. Okay, and life is just a series of, and if you can get them so close together, you almost don't notice the spaces between them. Okay, that was the idea that more was better, both in terms of each thing. If you had an ice cream, wouldn't it be better with fudge sauce? Wouldn't it be better with marshmallows? Wouldn't it be better with cherry? Wouldn't it be better with nuts? Wouldn't it, you know, and and on and on and on, and then a banana split, and then a double banana split, and then a an awful awful or whatever they get, you know, the huge things that more, and you look at people's obesity and you get, and that kind of super, that's the super sensual astral trip, that more is going to be enough, but more isn't ever enough. That's the horror of it, you know. Six o'clock, man realizes that. That despair is the prerequisite for the rest of the clock. For, and at 6.01 starts the next game. That's when man, in his despair, looks inward or looks upward. And he starts to recognize something deeper within himself. And that's the place we're at. And, in a, in a cultural sense at this moment. I mean, like hundreds of thousands of people are at that point. 
there are very few at 8 o'clock, and there are fewer still at 9 o'clock, and there's maybe like three at 10.30, you know, I mean, in the world. You know, I mean, it gets really thin up there. But in terms of where the culture previously, a couple of hundred years ago, was at 4 o'clock, now the culture's at 6 o'clock, right? I mean, or at 5.30 anyway, right, with a good segment at 6, right? Now, uh, is that image clear? Is it clear? So uh, now starts the coming home. And what you're trying to do as you come back is you realize now that only when you uh, tune in to that which is the perfection, into the flow, when you surrender your trip into the trip, not my but thy will, O oh Lord, are you going to get that thing you wanted in the first place? That is the feeling of the perfect orgasm, the continuous perfect orgasm, is not going to come through your mastery and control, but through your surrender. Okay. But surrender is anathema to somebody at four o'clock, see, because that's power. It's losing power to surrender. It depends on what you're surrendering to, whether you're surrendering into the universe or you're surrendering to another human being's mentality. See. We've always thought of surrender. We've always thought, see, we are coming out of a culture that is man over nature man's control over nature, not recognizing that nature is the most obvious and gross manifestation of the Divine Mother, of the forms of the universe. And you're trying to master and control that of which you are a subsection. It's like the fallacy of something trying to control that out of which it comes. The, the, in, in logic, it's an impossibility. It's, it's a subset trying to define the set out of which it comes, all right? It's just an impo a logical impossibility. And it's, a, it's an absurdity. It's an absurdity, what man keeps trying to do. And now what happens is people after 6 o'clock flip their understanding and they start to move into a culture that is man in nature rather than man over nature. Because man over nature has led to ecological imbalance. It's led to total paranoia not total, but large paranoia of distrust among human beings because everybody's trying to optimize the game for themselves. The game after six o'clock realizes you move into what in chakra terms is called the fourth chakra, which is that of compassion or more like Christ consciousness, and you move into an awareness that for me to have what I really want, you've got to have it too, okay. which is the realm of brotherhood not as an intellectual trip, but as a, an obvious perceptual reality. Because if I look in your eyes and I see somebody else just like me, it's very hard for me to figure out that I can screw you and get away with it because you and I are the same being. We're just in two different forms, right? So that the whole nature of the social game starts to change with these new levels of consciousness. And that changes economics, it changes politics, it changes it changes the entire fabric of human existence. Very slowly and very gently. But you feed in a few beings. You feed in even one being, one Buddha, or one Christ, or one such being at any time in history. And you feed in, once again, the choice, the manifestation of a real choice for human beings to see the possibility of living in God, living back in the Garden of Eden, living back in that harmony closing the ring, coming back up to 12 o'clock, right? And what enlightened, realized beings are, are there beings that got up to 1159, had the choice of either diving into 12 o'clock and giving up form completely, becoming just one with the empty, that which is God, which is beyond the concept of God, because the concept of God is still in form, but God isn't in form, right? Or making a commitment, which is called the Bodhisattva vow in Tibetan Buddhism, to stay in form in order to liberate other beings, okay? To bring that light back down. And those are gurus, they're saints, those are those beings. Whether they've done it in this lifetime or they've incarnated consciously, like a Christ does. And, uh, I mean, to understand that the real sacrifice Christ made was not the crucifixion, but in leaving the Father in the first place to take an incarnation. That was the real sacrifice that he made. Because for such beings 
to stay separate from God is an incredible uh, sacrifice. That is becoming the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. That is what it is. You come into a gross form and live in a gross life for no reason. You don't want any rush out of it at all because you already have the potential of having the whole rush. It's all yours. You give it up. You give up the total, orgasmic, eternal unity in order to stay separate, just a thread of separateness, in order to be a doorway through which others can get there. Okay? And though the existence of such a being in the world, or the existence of such beings, historically or presently, keeps creating for man the possibility of that happening. The choice. It gives man another chance to make a choice to look up rather than looking down. Right? Now, sequentially, once you look up, as I said before, once you look up, you see the perfection of the universe, but if you get too enamored with that and forget your fellow man and humanity, you've blown it again because God is everywhere. It's all the forms. So you ultimately have to look up and look down. Jesus looked down. At the same moment, he said to everybody, I come not, don't, it's not me you're after, because that's down, that's the sun. I come as a representative of my father. That's the up. That's the formless. And uh, Buddha said, don't worship me, because I'm just a guy that's teaching you. R go to nirvana, which is the father, which is that which is beyond form. It's the same thing. And uh, the Jews say the whole game is G-D. It's that which is unspeakable, right? It's the same place, same place. Uh, and Allah turns out to be the same thing. And, you know, you keep hitting it over and over again. And what excites me, or what, uh, the word wouldn't be excitement, but what delights me is the universality of the spirit that exists behind religious metaphors. The religions are religions, but the spirit is the spirit. And it's that kind of thing. So, why people meditate, what they do is when they want to get hooked into this kind of a circuitry, when they start to hear this kind of stuff, they want to turn inside and they want to know how to do it. And there are many methods available for doing this kind of thing. Many large institutionalized methods like transcendental meditation and things like that all of which will give you a basic beginning. The problem is a lot of these institutions sell short of what is possible. They've taken a possibility to allow man to transcend his mortality and they've turned it back into mortality, saying you'll have more pleasure in life by being more meditative, which is true. But that's very much short of the mark because pleasure isn't still going to be enough. So that it's kind of important that you that hear this message keep your own intuitive sense of what's possible going as you use methods that are, might be found available to you.